All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a lovely July 6th, 2020, talking about intermittent fasting. Is it worth the hype? So just to, to start off, just a disclaimer that this is not intended to replace any medical advice or meant to be relied on to treat, cure, or prevent any disease, illness, or medical condition. The attendance does not establish the patient-doctor relationship. If uh, you do have any of these conditions, I suggest that you bring this up to your uh, family doctor, general practitioner, or naturopathic physician, or nurse practitioner. So to start off, just a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Romy Fung, and I am a practicing naturopathic physician here in Richmond, British Columbia, uh, with a general practice, but my clinical interests uh, lie in uh, improving the quality of life and treating those with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Uh, I did my naturopathic medical training at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, and prior to that, did my pre-medical training in Simon Fraser uh, with a degree in health sciences. And currently, I'm just finishing up my master's in aging and health at Queen's University before embarking, as of next month, uh, a PhD also in aging and health at Queen's University. Uh, as a naturopathic physician, I do treat quite a few of those with uh, dementia. And one of the things that we talk about in terms of their behaviors and lifestyles has to do with the timing of eating, specifically intermittent fasting. And there has been a lot of growing evidence when it comes to intermittent fasting, especially for brain health. You might have heard of intermittent fasting for other things, such as weight loss, um, for reversing uh, diabetes, um, kidney health, uh, brain health. And there are elements of intermittent fasting in things such as um, some people might incorporate uh, keto dieting or putting your body in a state of ketosis where the body then doesn't use glucose as its main source of energy, but fats. And that's the fat stored in the body. And there has been evidence that your brain actually runs better with those fats, and thus brain health is greatly improved. And you see this also in not just uh, patients with some form of cognitive impairment, but um, seizures and all sorts of other uh, mental health conditions. So I'm happy to share with you today intermittent fasting with the context of dementia. So with that being said, why don't we get started? So how did intermittent fasting come about? There has been a lot of media in the past, you know, almost decade now saying, is this a really new panacea or a, a new form of weight loss that everyone should be doing. But how did it come about? Right now, the weight of the evidence um, suggests that in the past, we have um, hunter-gatherers that rarely experience um, or really experience times of food shortage. I mean, in the past, even almost like not even a, uh, a century ago, uh, people didn't really have endless easy access to food. Heck, they didn't have like an arm's length to any form of, any form of um, food, snacks, or even a refrigerator <laughs> for that matter. So internet, intermittent fasting, or IF, uh, is naturally incorporated in their lifestyles and in their eating schedule. Part because only that they have to, if they're hungry, then they have to start hunting before they can get the food that they can eat. So there has to be that time in between before they can even get to the food. So it's really nothing new in this case. It's like an ancient way of eating. And unlike our ancient ancestors, where they didn't really have access to food at all times, they had to put in the work and the time to get the food into their bellies. So it's really hard to adhere to a schedule that we have today where, you know, some people or a lot of people have breakfast between the hours of eight and 10 in the morning, lunch at noon, dinner at around six and seven. 
some days these hunter gatherers might be having small portions of food, you know, at specific times of the day, and other days they may not even have anything. So fasting is a natural part of the the meal pattern. Going uh, going hungry every now and then is actually not just healthy, but evolutionary normal. So what is intermittent fasting? Um, there are many terms for it. You have time-restricted eating um, or just restricted eating in general, but it is a way of eating that calls for alternating between fasting and eating at specific times. So the practice of going for prolonged periods without eating. It is different from many other diets, if you want to call this a diet, <laughs> that it's not really about eating specific foods. But at the same time, intermittent fasting is not about depriving yourself either. Rather, it's about eating your meals at a certain time frame and fasting for the rest of the day or night. And what kind of time frames are we talking about here? Well, there's many different forms that you can talk, uh, talk about. And here are just only a few of them that's more of the common side. Um, just looking down at the bottom there, there's something called lean gains, which is probably the most common form of intermittent fasting, or at least commonly known, where some people would take it as 16 hours fasting and eight hours feeding. In most cases, this would mean not having breakfast and then just waking up, fasting, having a glass of water or a cup of coffee without cream or sugar, and going on with your day until you have your first meal to break the fast, which is lunch. Now that kind of sounds almost counterintuitive because breakfast is meant to break the fast and then you have lunch. But um, that has been one of the more common ways of implementing intermittent fasting and also different variations too. Um, doesn't have to be 16-8. Uh, some people will do 14-10 or 12-12. Really depends on the body's capabilities and also the person's lifestyle. But there are other ways of um, fasting intermittently, one of them called the alternate day fasts, where you actually fast for 36 hours, meaning, say for instance, you have breakfast on a Monday, then you won't have anything that rest of the day you pretty much fast overnight on monday and all day and overnight on tuesday and then you get to eat again from sorry let backtrack back a back uh, a bit so you have a 12 eating window starting let's say breakfast you have your normal meal 8 a.m to 8 p.m for example and then you'll be fasting from 8 p.m overnight on to Tuesday, saying that we start on Monday, and then you fast all day Tuesday, and you get back onto your meal on the, mo uh, the morning of Wednesday. So that's a 36 hour fast and a 12 hour feeding window. <clears throat> then there's meal skipping. Uh, some people might experience the, um, the hangriness when it comes to the randomness of meal skipping. But that's what it really means. It's skipping you know, uh, a specific meal, whether that be breakfast, lunch, or dinner, maybe once, maybe twice a week. And that's to really kind of jumpstart the body. It's very flexible in that way, in that missing a meal isn't the end of you or isn't the end of life. Then there's something called eat, stop, eat, where you fast for 24 hours, a couple times a week, maybe even just once a week or even once a month. <coughs> and some people would think 24 hours. Sorry, one second here. <coughs> Body's waking up here. Um, some people would think 24 hours is, you know, quite some time, right? Am I supposed to really eat, uh, not eat for a full day? And you can actually reframe that and say, well, I can have breakfast on a Monday and then I will fast until the breakfast of the following day. So you're still getting kind of that one meal a day kind of thing, 
Some people would think you would have to wake up and not eat anything throughout the rest of the day. And that's one way too. Again, it has, it's more to do with how your lifestyle is and how we can find ways to go about that. Now, if you really want to be the extreme, then there's the warrior diet where you're really fasting for 24 hours and only having a four hour feeding window. And some people do that daily. Some people do that a few days a week. And some people don't do it at all. <laughs> and then there's other people. And you might have heard of other fasts, which have to do with um, more so cleanses. But you might have heard of a, a three-day water fast or even a, a week or something along the lines of um, meal planning and all that. And those are also different types of fasting as well maybe not as common as the ones that I've listed here, but the, the point here is there's many things to consider. The length, how often, so the length of the fast, the length of the feeding window, how often is it gonna be daily? Is it gonna be a few days a week? Is it gonna be monthly? And then there's that final component, which is up to your kind of um, measure, and that's, what kind of food do you want to eat? But that's not really the component of fasting or intermittent fasting itself. That's where you, that's where a lot of people start blending in things such as keto or paleo and all sorts of Mediterranean, that sort of thing. But when it comes to the fasting, I wouldn't argue that we're genetic, uh, genetically adapted to this kind of eating pattern that has periods of fasting incorporated to it. I mean, we do go hang uh, hungry every now and then, and for some people, we go hangry. But eating all the time it never really gives our digestive tract or digestive machinery, in some cases, uh, a rest. And that really isn't quite wise. So, and this has been found through the growing evidence that it's supported right now that it may be evolutionary, as well as the growing body of research that intermittent fasting, when done properly, might help with a lot of various health benefits in terms of regulating blood glucose, controlling blood lipids, reducing the risk of coronary disease, managing body weight, and helping us gain or maintain lean mass, muscle mass, reduce the risk of cancer, and much more improve glycemic control, reducing blood pressure. But with that being said, intermittent fasting is no panacea. It's not going to cure autoimmune disease, make you lose 10 pounds in a week, for example, or give you rock hard abs, but at least not by itself. It should be combined with you know, a good healthy diet, good sleep, exercise, and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is intermittent fasting isn't really the foundation for, let's say, the foundation of the cake. It merely is the icing. But we're starting to find evidence, first off, mostly in animal studies, that prolonged fasting has been shown to extend a lot of the lifespans of um, animals, uh, including you know, fish, rats, mice. And some of these um, benefits may be coming from the fact that there's alterations in energy metabolism. The body might be reallocating its own resources so that it's able to do other things besides just digesting food 24-7. But And because it reallocates that energy, it could potentially um, be able to quench a lot more of the oxidative damage and that gives a chance for insulin to become more sensitive and, uh, and less resistant. And also a lot of functional changes that happen in both the neuroendocrine and the sympathetic nervous systems. So there's been some uh, recent uh, evidence, one study in 2016 by Morrow et al. that provided a trial on 34 resistant trained males that is assigned randomly to either time-restricted feeding, or still having the normal timing. They call it a normal diet, which doesn't make sense, only because they still have the same food 
and the same amount of cal uh, calories, the caloric intake is the same. So at 100% of energy. But what they changed was either having an eight hour eating window, meaning each group has three meals. This eight hour eating window, the fasted or the time restricted feeding is having, they're having their meals at 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. Or the normal diet where they're eating at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 8 p.m. So the 12 hour eating window. And this went on for eight weeks. And they found that those who were restricted in their uh, time restricted in their feeding had decreased fat mass compared to those with the normal diet. And there was no other elements of change besides the timing. But not only was fat mass decreased, they also did some blood tests and they also found that um, other uh, effects uh, occurred physiologically, so within the body. One of them is something called adipo, uh, yeah, adiponectin. And adiponectin, when it's increased, really shows that there's a lot of metabolism going on. And high, le uh, high levels of adiponectin are associated with a reduced risk of a heart attack. So this is actually a hormone that modulates a lot of the, the metabolism, the metabolic processes, including blood sugar regulation and even fatty, uh, fatty acid oxidation. So this is meaning burning off the fat. And so this was one of the things. Another one is something called leptin. And leptin, you probably have heard, has to do with regulating your appetite. And they found that those who were in the time-restricted feeding had lower levels of leptin. And that could be up for uh, interpretation, but that to me shows that your leptin, you, you need less of that leptin to work, meaning the leptin has become a lot more sensitive. And that is a regulator in uh, body weight and also your appetite because they find that in uh, those with uh, obesity have extremely high levels of leptin because there's something called leptin resistance. And there is that idea right now that it potentially can be insulin resistance contributing to obesity, but it's also leptin resistance that doesn't really send that uh, feedback loop telling your body, I'm getting full. And if you are resistant to leptin, then chances are you're probably eating a lot more and you're not really getting that, um, that hunger feedback or that fullness satiety kind of uh, sensation. So it's kind of like the body trying to tell itself, I'm getting full, I better stop. But do we ever uh, actually listen to those signals? That's starting to kind of identify the levels of um, leptin sensitivity and leptin resistance. So looking at this, they really want to find out more about why is it that intermittent fasting is having these kind of effects and what are the processes about it. And one of them has to do with insulin resistance. Well, could it be that because you're restricting time that you might be restricting the amount of calories that you're intaking? It's possible, but with the study that we just saw in the previous slide, that doesn't always have to be true. Uh, in this case, insulin resistance is um, one thing that really contributes to a lot of our chronic diseases today regarding in, you know, hyperglycemia, that's high blood sugar, uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, dyslipidemia, high lipids, visceral adiposity, so that's um, the pear, the pear shaped, or the uh, sorry, the apple kind of shape of uh, fat accumulation just around the waist, um, and also um, uric acid, hyperuricemia um, to do with uh, gout, elevated inflammatory markers. So this could be due to uh, this could be contributing to chronic pain, chronic systemic pain. 
and a lot of other heart conditions too. So could insulin resistance be that component of cardiovascular disease and that could intermittent fasting be that component that helps insulin become less resistant and more sensitive, leading to the reduction of uh, blood pressure, of markers in um, blood sugar, oxidative stress, even without weight loss. I mean, right now, weight loss is probably secondary to a lot of our health conditions. So it's about not just addressing that weight, but to really understand that what is causing that weight to be gained in the first place. And right now, they're finding evidence that early time-restricted feeding improves the insulin sensitivity that could then lead to the downstream effects of better cardiovascular health, weight loss, and even uh, in other cases uh, that we're going to be talking about, dementia. Another thing or another proponent that uh, inter uh, intermittent fasting works on is something called autophagy. And autophagy has two parts to it, auto meaning self and phagy meaning eat meaning autophagy is literally you're eating yourself but that's the body's way of cleaning out damaged cells in order to uh, create new cells and regenerate uh, newer healthier cells because every cell has its own lifespan and if they're going either near the end of their lifespan or even beyond well, their functionality might not be the greatest. It might not be the most efficient. As such, also, you can clean out the cells through autophagy before they become damaged. And they, when they become damaged, well, they can become toxic potentially. So autophagy then prevents that toxicity to happen first and foremost. Um, because a broad range of studies has now really showed that um, by having less of the autophagy, so a decline in autophagy is now associated with a lot of pathologies such as uh, neuro, neurodegeneration, so this upbringing of dementia and cognitive impairment, cognitive incline, incline yeah, decline. Um, cancer and inflammation and even speaking more about this cognitive impairment um, that damaged proteins can maybe lead to improper folding of the proteins thus staying in the brain and leading to the so-called tau proteins as well as the um, beta amyloid plaque which is the hallmark of alzheimer's disease so Right now, there hasn't been a really set time. Um, a lot of research is going on figuring out when does this autophagy occur. And a lot of experts say that um, or agree that autophagy happens or initiates between 18 and 20 hours of fasting. But again, each person is going to be very different with the maximal benefits reaching at about you know, the 48 to 72 hour mark. However, with our uh, daily lives and our, our behaviors and lifestyles, some of us can't even go on beyond, you know, missing one meal. And for some of us, um, for a lot of us, we were told that, you know, having more meals more often uh, can really help with uh, metabolism, for example. And there is research to that. But in order to get the body to not constantly digest food and working on its digestive tract and allowing the body some time and peace actually to be able to clean out a lot of the other things. There is that balance that you really want to go into. But then there's this other kind of um, research or debate going on about what the hunger response is. Is hunger actually meant to be innate? As in, do we actually follow our hunger cues? Or is hunger actually an environmental kind of thing? 
because we've been raised and grown up with we must have three meals a day do you think that it's that lifestyle that's getting us into this hunger routine where missing a meal by missing a meal that we would think oh no something's going to happen when we've looked into a bit of the history where some of the humans the human um, hunter gatherers may not even have food for for a couple days so there's something to think about in terms of societal cues and environmental cues too in fact um, there's one thing that uh, now that we're going into this kind of talk about the brain and dementia there's this uh, uh, one study that I encountered about uh, how the brain actually works better when you're fasting, or at least the brain becomes more clearer when you're fasting. And you're thinking, but it doesn't really have the energy does, uh, to actually feel it. Well, let's think of it the other way around, and that's something that you might even want to think about. Have you ever heard of or experienced the term food coma? where you had a meal and you're probably just wanting to, to die off and take a nap and such. So does that ever make you think about if the brain really needs that kind of fuel or if it's burdened by what we're eating at that point? And so this brings me to this next part of the lecture. How does fasting support dementia? And there's many things in terms of the processes that a lot of animal studies have come to um, bring light on. But more interestingly, uh, first thing, fasting insulin is inversely related to memory. Has anyone ever heard of the fact or the term that is kind, kind of coming to light that Alzheimer's disease is coined the term type three diabetes? Well, the lower you're able to drive down or people driving down the insulin levels, the more improvement the memory score for these patients or these um, subjects actually exhibit. So insulin could be potentially one thing, especially when you have insulin resistance, that shows that you have would have likely uncontrolled blood glucose levels or blood sugar levels in the body. And sugar um, is found to be very inflammatory, but at the same time, sugar does something if you leave it alone. And what it does is it really binds to the proteins in whatever situation it is, whether that be the blood vessels, the cells, etc. And it binds the protein through a process called glycation. And glycation, this bond between protein and sugar, is irreversible. So when it's irreversible, the body then finds it. When you have the uh, sugar bounded, bounded to the protein, the body has no other choice but to either pretty much destroy that cell and to clear it off. And that leads to increase in inflammation because in order to destroy something and to clear something, you need to recruit the white blood cells. And in order to recruit what, uh, white blood cells, you need to have inflammation so that you can get that flow of fluid and the blood and other mediators and markers required. So this is why when someone is diabetic, that they're constantly being checked on for their eyesight and for their feet because the smallest blood vessels that are most prone to damage happens to be in the eyes first and then a common um, sequelae of uh, diabetes tends to be that people might have to get an amputated foot or their foot amputated because um, their feet start to uh, fester up and get gangrene which is not really a really a pretty sight but that's because the body is kind of clearing out and fighting this so-called glycation so think about that happening in the brain then it's one thing to think about 
Another thing, uh, mostly in mouse models, is something called HSP70. And HSP70, when isolated, uh, acts to prevent damage and the misfolding of the tau and amyloid proteins. So these proteins are bound to misfold in some ways because no one's perfect. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. But because there's nothing that's perfect, we have mechanisms in our body to prevent that or unfold that. And one of that found in the mouse models is HSP70. <clears throat> and that these HSP70 has been found to be increased in terms of fasting or with autophagy as well. Another thing that occurs is something called aquaporin-4. Now we're going, I'm sorry if I'm going pretty deep in the science, but I really want to share the, uh, some of the mechanisms because that's my passion as a physician to really understand how the body works. But uh, another thing is we talked about HSP70 and how that kind of helps unfold the misfolded and improperly folded proteins. But then there's something called aquaporin 4 or AQP4 that helps with the clearance of these proteins. And that um, it's not just about creating and misfolding uh, amyloid. Amyloid also needs to be cleared. So it's that, uh, it's that balance of having too much, too little, maybe both, who knows. But um, clearance is also found to be um, impaired in those with living with um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And so fasting has been found to really increase the uh, AQP4 or the aquaporin-4 uh, proteins that really helps with clearing a lot of the amyloid plaques and also the ends, uh, pretty much it's kind of like that cleaning mechanism that you need. So fasting then really stimulates a lot of the cleaning that's involved. And speaking of cleaning, and I'll bring this up uh, in a couple slides from now, cleaning is also needed in the brain first and foremost. And that has to do with fasting. But another thing that fasting has been shown to really increase is something called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotropic factor. And brain-derived neurotropic factor is it's almost like that miracle grow. It's that it's a substance that stimulates growth in the brain. And so there are many ways to really ramp up the BDNF to really maintain and even grow the brain because we're right now in the past couple decades, we know, know we now know that the brain is very um, plastic, that neuroplasticity that helps create even new brain um, connections just by using them. Fasting being one thing to help increase it, other things include proper sleep, proper exercise, um, coffee, but in the form of the coffee fruit. Now that's a big misconception about people drinking coffee for brain health. Uh, coffee, the coffee that we drink uh, in our everyday lives has to, uh, comes from the coffee bean. There's actually a coffee fruit that you could probably look into in Google, but that actually increases BDNF. And that's something I have a, a couple of my patients on too. And speaking about my patients, I do this quite often with a lot of my dementia patients, something called Ketoflex 12 slash three. And what that means is, based on this food pyramid, uh, sorry, the, the text here is, up, is black when it should be white, is that we need to focus primarily on fasting first before we even think about what kind of foods help the brain. Because you probably know that the brain is, consists of 70% fat, so we need to have proper fats to build a brain. And that you probably have heard of the gut-brain axis, and thus uh, working on the gut, 
getting the probiotics, getting the resistant starches and the prebiotics, the fiber, to really ramp up the health of the gut, to ramp up the health of the brain. So these things are all good, but I need to first and foremost get them to fast because we need to get things moving. And if your body is not cleaning properly, chances are whatever we recommend, whether that be self-recommendation or a dietitian, doctor, naturopath, in regards to your diet, it could potentially gunk up um, the system. And so I get my patients with dementia. Um, we work our way up, but something called KetoFlex 12-3. Keto meaning ketosis. So that's when, the, when we put our body into the state and breaking down its own fat to use for fuel. Flex meaning the metabolic flexibility. So it's also the flexibility of the diet, meaning uh, we're not too concerned about what you eat. Of course, that's going to be a double whammy if we also work with the diet. And 12-3 refers to two things. 12 meaning the minimum number of hours I want a patient to be fasting. So ideally 12 hours minimum. That's usually where some level of autophagy starts to ramp up. Of course, the longer the better, but while you're being monitored, of course. And then the three has to do with the fact that I need my patients to be fasting three hours before bed. Now, that's probably hard for a lot of people who have a snack or have some form of um, um, food, snack, cookies, whatever, uh, before bed. But why I actually get them to fast three hours before bed has to do with a couple things. One of them is that eating before sleep has been actually shown to not only inc uh, increase morning appetite leading to more eating, but it also increases insulin resistance. At the same time, there's something called the lymphatic system. And this is kind of interesting um, for anyone who has uh, a child in medical school or are planning to go into medical school. If you look at, um, I think it was the Gray's Anatomy textbooks, uh, but most textbooks would likely follow suit with this is if you look at the lymphatic system, and if you don't know what the lymphatic system is, it's pretty much our cleaning system. It's our detox pathway and getting everything that's toxic into the lymph and so forth. But the lymphatic system cleans the body and runs alongside the cardiovascular system, so the heart and the blood vessels, only because the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump to be able to move the lymph or the fluid that's in the lymphatics. So it depends on the pressure coming from the heart onto the blood vessels and moves that way. But why I brought up the textbook part of the medical system is that in, the, in this left picture, this was probably, probably early 2000s, maybe even 2010. It wasn't, wasn't until just a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, I need to check my textbooks again, that they said that the lymphatics only go up to a certain point in the body. But now we're actually finding that they're lymphatics that go up to the brain. And so why do I bring this up? Well, when you're sleeping or First off, before you sleep, if you eat something and that food goes into the stomach and goes into the small intestine, how does the body react to ensure that the digestion really is facilitated? That requires the body to recruit more blood from the rest of the body and go straight into the stomach and in the intestines so that more blood then can work the muscles and feed the muscles that are digesting the foods 
and absorbing them. But by taking the blood away from, most importantly, the brain, well, the lymphatics don't really have much blood then to, uh, to have that pressure supported. And so things start to get a little stagnant, especially in the brain. And that's potentially the, the cause of the food coma too. But when you're asleep, when you get into the deep levels of sleep, specifically about two to three hours into sleep, your lymphatics in the brain, something called glymphatics, because the brain cell is called glial cell. So you take the G from glial and add it to lymphatic, thus glymphatic. These glymphatic cells and system, the vessels, expand and open up to like four times its actual size. So more lymph can flow and more waste can be then collected and uh, taken out. So researchers have found that these openings have really contributed to this kind of understanding that during sleep, your brain is probably doing its most cleaning, the maximum amount of cleaning possible. And without proper blood flow going up to the brain, the lymphatic system doesn't have that pressure that it could depend on. And thus, that cleaning mechanism is then compromised. And that's why I would like to say to most of my patients to ideally ensure that you're not eating uh, three hours prior to bed. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't have fluids or tea if it's not sweetened uh, or, with, or caffeinated even. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why we do this. So of course, intermittent fasting seems like almost like a miracle thing, but there are many considerations that we have to uh, abide by and to think about before we even consider putting anyone on intermittent fasting. Uh, for example, our hormones. Um, our, horm our hormones are regulated by uh, something called the hypothalamus in the brain secreting a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH to the part of the brain called the anterior pituitary. And it's this anterior pituitary that then releases luteinizing hormone and fo uh, follicular stimulating hormone, LH and FSH, to signal our testes and our ovaries to produce testosterone and estrogen, our sex hormones. So this chain is really specific, but it's the GnRH, the gonadotropin releasing hormone, is really sensitive to environmental factors and can be really thrown off by fasting. And so a lot of women, for example, who go through the fasting uh, may see that if they go too much or too intense, that they might actually lose their periods and their fertility might be compromised. Um, they found that in um, young, but not uh, older, young adults, that um, the secretion of GnRH is suppressed but reversible in fasted or even malnourished humans. So hormones is definitely one thing to consider. So before you even do intermittent fasting, not just with um, the hormones, but if you have cardiovascular disease, uncontrolled diabetes, or other chronic conditions, to really consult with your physician first and foremost. Spe specifically, and especially, you, shouldn't, you don't want to be uh, doing intermittent fasting if you're pregnant, because you know pregnant women have extra energy needs. You're not feeding for one, you're feeding for two. So fasting may not be a good idea for that. And specifically, if you have a history of disordered eating, well, you might want to make sure that you are getting support if you really want to consider fasting, because we want to make sure that your electrolytes and your, your electrolytes are normal and you're still getting some level of nutrition that the body is needed. Because if you're chronically stressed and, well, if you don't sleep well, duh, <laughs> um, your body needs extra nurturing non-additional stress. 
Um, intermittent fasting is not for everyone. It can work, but it doesn't need to be. Why mess with your health? You can achieve similar benefits in other ways. And when you do intermittent fasting, you might actually experience some side effects. Um, I actually brought up one of my side effects, and that was headaches. <laughs> when I did my uh, hike a couple days ago at the uh, Eagle Mountain Trail in Coquitlam, um, we hiked for about five hours there and back. It was quite treacherous, and I was already fasting since um, 10 p.m. the night before. And we didn't finish our hike till about 4 p.m. So I was pretty much fasting for 18 hours plus because we didn't actually eat until about an hour and a half afterwards. So headaches is one thing to um, be aware of. Uh, difficulty fo uh, focusing or brain fog, fatigue, low energy, uh, nausea, you know, like you want to throw up, uh, bad breath, uh, cramping up the legs or the feet even, faster heart rate, lightheadedness, and reduced physical performance. So the bottom line here is that likely it's dehydration and the subsequent mineral loss that lies behind most of these transitional side effects. Uh, the idea here, it's really important to stay hydrated and to even supplement with sea salt or Himalayan salt to replenish lost minerals because this transition leads to lower blood pressure for most people and staying hydrated and having adequate salt intake will alleviate and prevent this problem or prevent this from uh, becoming a problem. But the bottom line is if this is something that you want to be going for, uh, that you're all in for and you would like to try it but are new to this kind of uh, uh, dietary or lifestyle, that it's best that you consult with your medical doctor, general practitioner, uh, naturopathic physician, or even nurse practitioner before you consider doing intermittent fasting, especially, and I'm gonna have to enforce that, especially if you have a concurrent condition. So to summarize, uh, intermittent fasting, or also is known as time-restricted feeding, involves the practice of going for prolonged periods without eating and alternating that with um, feeding periods. And we learned a few of the phys uh, physiological effects that happen with fasting and how it can also benefit uh, persons with dementia. But of course, um, consider consulting with your physician so that you can find and establish uh, a lifestyle or establish a agreement that fits with your lifestyle. Because it's not really that one size fits all whether that be the length of the time, um, how often, and how long. And that concludes my short talk here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, if you liked what you see or what you heard, uh, I have a lot of social media um, backgrounds, uh, like me on Facebook, follow me on Instagram, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. This video is recorded and uh, will be posted in YouTube. You can also find me and also uh, get notifications for future talks and so forth uh, through my Facebook as well as through my Instagram. Uh, more information about what I do in practice through my website at www.drromifungnd.com. And if you have questions outside of this talk, um, you're more than welcome to contact me at contact drromifungnd.com. Now, in regards to our talks, uh, today is July the 6th, 2020, and that's our talk on intermittent fasting. We have a break next week, and then we have four more talks coming up and more all along on the way with July 20th talking about natural naturopathic approaches to Alzheimer's disease and dementia, July 27th to do with Keto 101, 
And just a reminder that August 3rd is BC Day, so we're not going to have a talk then. But the week after, we're going to be talking about supplement truths and myths. And then after that, osteoporosis. If you have any other topics that you're interested in hearing, uh, bring that up to the chat, and we'd be more than happy to continue that with this kind of series online here. And all these talks require registration through the Richmond Public Library and on, uh, in, on an individual basis, meaning you would have to register for each and every single one of them. And the link, the Zoom link will be emailed uh, usually a day prior. So with that being said, I'm going to stop the recording here.